I think it's already a bit after two. So good afternoon to everybody, and I hope everybody had a nice lunch. And this, I think, the first session for the security, or the first talk of the security session. And my name is Elena Reshitova, and I'm coming from Nokia MIMO platform. And I don't know if many of you are familiar with this uh, N900 device. So this is a device which runs a open source development platform. The name is MIMO. I guess there is even a competition where you can get some of these uh, devices today. And uh, I'm working for platform security in, in MIMO and uh, the new platform security which is coming for MIMO 6 release. And this presentation is supposed to give a short overview about uh, MIMO platform security. And let's see how much time we have. I would like also to uh, leave a time for questions. So here is a short outline. So first of all, uh, I will just briefly talk about what is platform security, or to be sure that we speak the same language uh, when we say this term, platform security. Then we will take a look on uh, different, two different device modes of operation for MIMO 6 device. And uh, I, I will say the reasons for these two different modes, and uh, also during the boot, we will take a look on a boot process to understand uh, how you can get uh, these two different modes loaded. We will take a look on access control, one of the primary things in a uh, security framework, and we will take a look on different things related to access control. Uh, also integrity protection, and uh, we will finish with uh, security, uh, security of inter-process communications. So what is platform security? So here in the slide it says that it's a set of mechanisms and techniques which are used to protect the entire software platform. So let's Imagine we will try to build a house which called platform security. So what are the bricks here? So what are the mechanisms and techniques are here? So in the bottom of our house, there is a big brick called hardware enablers. So this is uh, actually a very important uh, piece for whole platform security. So these hardware enablers are needed in order to uh, guarantee that uh, software, the security software which uh, runs on top of it, it's actually really secured from the uh, uh, software and attacks, possible attacks. Then there is three middle bricks, which here stand for integrity protection, access control, and uh, privacy protection. So uh, integrity is to, we need to protect integrity. In this case, it's integrity of uh, binaries, executables, also configuration data files. So everything which we would like to be sure that it was not modified during the lifetime of a device. Of course, authorized modification allowed, but on non-authorized or not. And when the access control, very uh, known thing in security frameworks, so who is allowed to access what and why and so on. And a very last one is the privacy protection. So here it mostly means the encryption, encryption of user data or your private data for reasons that you would like to keep, keep them secret and not accessible for anything else than uh, a set of, for example, limited programs. And uh, on the side of all these um, bricks of our house, there is a key management. So key management is needed on all of these levels, so that's why it stands aside. And on the top of the house, there is a uh, roof it called here security policy. So this is the uh, control point of whole platform security. So security policy defines how all these mechanisms are working and um, but it's the needed security level. So this is really just a couple of words put to explain what is platform security. And so now let's move to the interesting part. So it, here have a slide called device modes. So many people are afraid, so my uh, platform is an open, uh, open source development platform. And many people are afraid that now when I'm starting to speak about platform security, it means, okay, the platform will be closed. So when it's secure, there is like, a common understanding when security comes, the platform goes closed. So and that's why I have this first slide already uh, explaining you that it's not going to be the case. And we will take a look on the first mode of device operation. There is no particular name for this mode. I don't know. We probably will come up with interesting names after. But uh, this mode of device operation is, is the same mode as we used to have our, on previous MIMO releases. So for example, this, this device runs MIMO 5 release. So you can do whenever you want with a device. You can compile, build your, build your own kernel. You can 
run your own kernel, you can make any low le level platform development. So whenever you were able to do before, you can still do, and there is a special motive for you to do it. So the only thing that you need, you would need to put your device, uh, MIMA6 device to this mode, and then you, you can uh, do things that you would like to do. There is a second mode, which is uh, going to be for MIMA6, and the reason for introducing this mode, which I would like to uh, have uh, to even extend even more our developer offering. So we know that there are developers who would like to uh, make a bit of profit from their own very good software, and we would like to give a choice to them to do it. So it doesn't mean that uh, when it says here op uh, copy protection, it doesn't mean that all software needs to be copy protection and it will be DRM protected. It's just a choice for you. So if you would like to have the possibility to earn money on uh, this platform, you can you can use the copy protection, you can put your software into DRM, but if you don't want to do it, there's nobody who will force you to do it, so you can, uh, you can still distribute open software and it, it's more than welcomed. And there will be also a way to move between these two modes and uh, this can be done via the booting process and next slide will show how uh, actually you can reach each of these modes. So the boot process, very high level, so n not many details, will start from a boot room, which will first check integrity of a loader. And if integrity of a loader is okay, the loader can continue, so the loader starts to run, and it will check the integrity of software image. And if its software image is uh, considered to be Nokia sign software image, then this uh, second mode, which I showed uh, on a previous slide, so the mode with which provides you uh, DRM protection and like access to application store, which in Nokia called OV store. Uh, so you can load this mode because the kernel is fine, the software image is fine, and it's Nokia signed software image. So let's now take a look on what happens when some of these components are not fine. So if the loader is, if the integrity of the loader failed, then uh, we can't allow this because we can't allow an untrusted loader, so the device goes to reset, so we, we, are, we are not allowing the change of the loader. But if the integrity of software image failed, so there is still one question to be asked here. So if, if this device is SIM locked, so SIM locked here means that you, for example, buy the device from, from operator, usually it's less price, but you have to use it with the same, I, don't, I never tried to do it, so you probably have to use it for one year with some SIM card and uh, it's locked to the SIM card. So if the device is SIM locked, when uh, in picture it, has, it says that uh, the other image is not allowed, but it's, it, it's not up to us, so it depends uh, on operator, on your contract with operator, maybe some local legislation in a country, so we really don't have any stand on it. So it's up to operator, but it's also up to you to not to buy these devices from the operator. So. But just to uh, mention this part. And then uh, if device is not SIM locked, then uh, we will allow to, to boot uh, any unsigned kernel, any unsigned software image. With, uh, there is only one step which will happen in between here with this box saying restrict security functionality. So here, this step we need in order to protect things like, for example, DRM keys, because these keys can't be compromised, and we need to disable these keys. And there are also a couple of small things which happened here. But uh, after these things are done, you can uh, load pretty much any, or uh, so you, you can load any unsigned software image. So the one you did and the one you compiled. So nothing prevents you to do it. So this is, again, high level the boot process. So let's move to access control part now. And here we got actually quite many questions already that uh, there, existing, there are many existing uh, access control solutions in, in whole let's say, in whole operating systems. And the question, obviously, of which we were asked is, why are we doing our own access control here? And here's a slide which presents a bit of our reasoning why we decided to go this way. And first, let's start what we had before. So what, does our, the, uh, what do the previous MIMO devices have? Our, so the only thing we actually had, it was uh, the classical Unix access control model, which is a very user-centric user model. So it was... Uh, the threat, uh, the threat model at the time when it was developed was there was a number of users who were using the same PC and the goal was to separate data of these users with one, let's say, some bad user can't 
read your email, so can do can read your private files. So this was a threat model when this classical Unix access control was created, and it was discretionary access control. So user and owner of a file could change the ownership of a file, and and later the situation we, we were trying to change this. Uh, like let's say extend the classical Unix access control by introducing, for example, POSIX capabilities. And it was, I think, a very good idea, but they're not really in use now. So, for example, root by default has all of them and others users none. So, kind of the concept is there, but it's not really used. And then our criteria, so MIMO devices are mostly one user devices. So there's no actually need to protect like, one user from another user. So. Uh, what in the threat model now is that we would like to protect, protect data between the processes because there's many applications that user installs and the typical user, he doesn't really understand and like program may look very nice and things and can be malicious. So users don't understand it, they, install, they may install malicious programs and they may try to uh, steal the data and do other harmful things. So we would like to have the, uh, access control which is in process level. So we don't want to protect users between our, from each other, but we would like to protect processes from each other. And also, important thing that we wanted to have, we didn't want to change the enforcement model, the current Linux enforcement model too much, so the goal was to, to make a minimal change to it. And of course, things like root level of flexibility, granularity, some concept that would be easy to understand even for our for typical user, let's say, not only for specialist. And we did uh, a lot of analysis of current security frameworks and just access control frameworks, and some of them are listed in the slide. And uh, based on this analysis, I don't have time to explain it here, we actually uh, we understood that there was no uh, any of these frameworks which fit our criteria. And that's why we decided to go to with our model. And uh, I hope in the next slides I could explain it a bit. There's not much time, but let's try. So. Uh, if we start from beginning, so what are the principles and key concepts we are using? So the first one is, uh, let's say, a very obvious principle. It's called the principle of least privilege. So we try to, uh, so the principle it says, says that every application should be able to access only a limited set of resources which are needed uh, in order to uh, accomplish its intended task. So not any possible task, intended task. And this is very important in principle of least privileges. So you don't give more privileges to application which it needs to, uh, needs to have in order to uh, make its function. And I think it's a very good principle and basic principle of many access, and, uh, in access control frameworks and security frameworks in general. And then we have this uh, new concept we called here protected resource. So before on MIMO platform, all resources were available by default. So you, you call the API to get, let's say, location of, our, of the cur current location of the user, and you get location back. But now some of these resources will be projected. So examples here, like for example, cellular functionality. So the reason to protect these resources is it, that if the misusage of such resource could cause a harm, first of all, to a user or to a manufacturer of a device, so there is different scenarios, so that, that's co considered to be protected resource. We don't have any final lists. The work is really in progress, so we're not finished with this, all this platform security. But uh, we are on building it, we are in the process of building it. And then each of these protected resources will be uh, described with a uh, resource token. So resource token is like abstract name, abstract string describing this resource. And this will be a credential also for a process. So if a process would like to access a protected resource, it needs a corresponding resource token in its credentials. And then our application uh, also, from now, it, it has to declare the resources it needs. So, and for this one, we will have this IGES manifest file, which I'm going to introduce in more details in the next slide. And also important thing about our security framework, which there is no any security APIs by default, so you don't have to change your application in order to use some special security APIs. You, you can just use a standard one and benefit from security framework, which is underneath. So, a couple of words about IGES manifest file. So, um, in my map, platform, the uh, software distribution is done inside Debian packages. So, and uh, this edges manifest file, it's an optional XML file inside a Debian package. So optional means that uh, if you don't need any particular resources, you don't have to put it there. 
And when uh, this file, as I said, declares needed resources and all the also provided resources, because our, our models or our resource token model is dynamic. So any new package that comes, it could introduce a new resource that it personally would like to like control and protect. If it has some special, for example, database, it should, its own data, special database which it would like to protect, it can define a new resource for doing it. So it's, it's not limited in any way with uh, the concept. And then uh, this file will, should be generated automatically by ASDK, uh, given a source code of your program so that you don't have to figure out actually what kind of resource tokens my program needs in order to function normally. And uh, there is a couple of other stuff uh, about this Aegis manifest file, but I would like to introduce the last concept here, which is called application identifier. So this is uh, the unique identifier of an application on a platform. It's supposed to uh, supposed to preserve between uh, so during whole lifetime of an application on the device, and it, it constructed in the following way. So it from uh, identifier of software source where this application came from, a package name, and uh, the application name. In case there are many are uh, binaries, many applications inside of a package. And we will use this concept a bit later, so it's quite important one. So still a couple of words about software distribution. So as I said, software comes inside Debian packages. And from a device point of view, from application manager point of view, uh, each package has a software source. So in classical way, when, uh, it's uh, based on repository signing. So classical Debian distribution way, it's uh, the source is software repository, or it can be also any virtual entity if we used, we're also going to support package signing. So it also be, be single developer or web page or you know, somebody who has a key pair and can sign a package. Also, uh, so as I said, that, uh, for in order to be recognized, this uh, software source has to have an asymmetric key pair and public key needs to be known for a device and a private key used to send the packages, quite standard things. And uh, on, on the device, each so software source is assigned a trust level, and this trust level we will basically mostly use for, our, uh, let's say, uh, we'll call it update rule. So that you can't, if you have uh, some uh, package that came from a trusted source, very much trusted source, you should not be, be able to update this package with the source of less trust, because it, it may be, our, it, it may be used as an attack against the user, but user sees nice update which is available under, through, through its, for example, application manager, which is nice update of some system, very, very, very important system functionality, which comes from some completely unknown, maybe even uh, malicious source. So this is the way to prevent such an update. And uh, I will move forward. So I just security policy. So as I said in my first slide, with security policy, usually it's a control point of whole platform security. And this is our control point. And by the way, name IGIS doesn't, uh, I know that there is somebody else who is using the same name. So I think it's just collision of names happened. So we don't have anything to do with that IGIS. So IGIS security policy. It contains a mapping between software sources and allowed credentials for that source. So there is an example here below, but there is like three software sources there. One is Nokia, now one is Miami.org, so our open source development portal. And then there is a list of uh, resource tokens which this source can potentially grant for an application. So if an application comes from the source Miami.org, it can get user data, can get access to user data or seller functionality if it requires it in its IGES manifest file. And uh, this policy can be changed uh, for different set of, for different devices in order to uh, provide a different security levels on the devices. So this policy can be very strict or very uh, lightweight, and this is how you can change the security policy. And now let's take a look on our inter, our installation time, so how the components interacting with each other and uh, how actually the uh, application at the end gets the runtime credentials. So the application arrives to installer together with Debian package together with Aegis manifest. Installer consults the Aegis security policy to get the allowed set of credentials for that software source because it can determine the source of, uh, of this application. And then Based on this IGES manifest and IGES security policy entry, it, uh, com uh, it computes a rule, so used to what we call intersection rule, which I will show on the next slide, and it computes the runtime credentials uh, of a process and writes it to the file here called credential position list. 
So let's uh, take a look on this intersection rule. So very easy. So we have edges manifest inside a package which declares what kind of application would like to access. So in the example on the right side, there is its user data in Celera. So application would like to get the access to user data in Celera functionality. And then it comes from the software source and the software source uh, declares what kind of credentials uh, this application can get if it arrives, if it was certified by that software source. And an example here, there is user data and location. So, and at the end, the result credential set, result runtime credential set here for the, the example contains only user data. And this, uh, this is because that, uh, it, it can't get the seller, it, 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 it requested the seller here in Edges Manifest, but it can't get it because the software source this software source can't grant this resource. It doesn't have enough trust to grant this resource. And it also doesn't get location because it simply didn't request for location. So it didn't say in just manifest that it needs location. And this result credential set is actually the result runtime credential set which will be added to, uh, to the process. And here's the runtime. So what happens when an application starts? So uh, at the moment when it starts, we have a component called process credential assigner it uh, goes to this pro credential position list. It finds the entry related to this particular application. It finds the credentials, this runtime credentials, which uh, are loaded for this application. And then it loads them to the process task structure in the form of supplementary group IDs. So this is uh, how it's done technically. And then after process start to execute, and it's always have this supplementary group IDs attached to it, so credentials attached to it. And then uh, the access control happens, uh, for example, for file system, it happens as before. So there is no any changes here. So there is file access uh, control list in the file systems and there is process credentials and there is no any changes. In case of DBus uh, inter process communication, we have a small patch to a DBus daemon, which uh, the only, it's like small addition to DBus daemon. The only thing that addition does, it's, uh, allows the dbus daemon to take into consideration the supplementary group IDs. Because by default, dbus daemon takes, in, um, when it makes its access control decision, it takes into consideration only user ID and group ID from static files. And then, uh, so dbus daemon loads the process credentials and uh, dbus policy, so dbus configuration file, it called in dbus terminology. And then it can make an access control decision and they're going to be also a third way for application to make an access control. It can do it by itself. So it can uh, call our libcrates library. So we'll provide a special library to get a pro credentials of another process. And then it could check for a special credentials it, it, it needs. And then make a decision if it'd like to have uh, this application accessing some IPI or get some particular data. And just to finish with access control part, I would like to explain shortly this shared libraries case. So what happens when the application tries to load a shared library? So in the example here, we have an application which has two resource uh, tokens in its credentials, seller and user data, and would like to load library A. And we have like a bit of information here, but suppose library A comes from very strange uh, source, and this source is not unknown to uh, device security policy, so it's, it's not known, it's unknown source. And what happens? So the application uh, sends a request to kernel to load the library, Kernel redirected to our library checker component, which uh, will, uh, gets the credentials of application with seller and user data. It's, uh, det it will determine the source of the library, and it will load the credential set corresponding to that source. And then it will simply make uh, sure that the, uh, both sets are matching. And in this case, there is a mismatch because uh, application has access to seller functionality, but the library source can't grant it, so unknown source can't grant it. And in this case, uh, the loading of library fails. And this is, this is needed from security point of view in order to prevent that our uh, trusted processes load uh, very untrusted shared libraries. Because after the library is loaded to the process, where it's, it's in the process context, so it, it gets access to the same things that process gets. So very simple rule to avoid these things. And then if, in case it's a library B, which comes from the source which can grant seller in this example, uh, the loading will succeed and everything is fine. So let, let's uh, move on to the integrity protection now. So we have uh, two main components here. First one is HS validator. 
So this is the component which uh, ensures the integrity of all executables and the, uh, all, all different executables like binaries, libraries, scripts on the platform. So just a small picture how it works. So we have an application binary which is about to be started. We have HS validator which will calculate the hash over this uh, binary and then uh, it will uh, get the reference hash for this binary from special storage and the storage is populated during the installation of the, uh, the corresponding uh, package which brought this binary in and uh, it will try to match these hashes and if, there is a if everything is fine so the hashes match then the binary can start to execute and everything is fine but if there is a mismatch the integrity protection policy will be taken into use and uh, now it's very simple, so currently if there is a mismatch, the binary is simply not allowed to, to be loaded. Because uh, if the binary was modified on the device and not via, poly, uh, not via uh, in software update, so just simply modified, there's probably something wrong with this binary. And then uh, the storage of reference hashes, is, is also needs to be, we need to protect the storage because it's quite very important um, a part of information. And uh, for this, we use uh, the component we call HS Protected Storage. It's on the next slide. So this component can be used and uh, is used to ensure the integrity of data and configuration files. So I, ho I also get a small example here. So we have an application which has some uh, data or configuration files. And suppose it would like to protect the integrity. The integrity. Yes? Yes, so it can be used by applications as well. Uh, it, it just, uh, so I will explain, it's actually simply, it's not, it doesn't have any size, it simply allow, add you a signature or encryption over it. So it's just your data, it's not any particular size. Okay. So you just use the services to, which will consider it in a picture to uh, encrypt or send the data. So you have this, I just protect the storage APIs, it's a library which you can use. So you can call the API of this library to kind of place these files in protect the storage if, if you would like to guarantee integrity. But in principle it will just sign the data in its own way. And then every time you would like to check if your data is still okay, you can use a different API from the same library which like check integrity on a high level, and it will get the signature, it will verify the signature, and it will report you the status. So it will say if uh, this integrity of this data is okay or not, and it's up to you what to do after with it. So you can, even if its integrity was, it's not, if the file were modified, maybe you will decide to use it anyway. But there is, it's just a mechanism that you can use. And also this protects storage provides you not only integrity protection, but also encryption. So it could provide you, so you can use it to uh, store uh, securely the files which you would like to encrypt even. And this pro uh, even uh, survives, the, or it's, uh, survives the offline attacks, so it's really encryption here. And just to finish, I think I have a couple of minutes left. Let's move to our IPC communication, so yes, uh, pardon. So Yeah, it, it's a simple file, you can open it and you can see that all stuff is encrypted where you can't even. So you can open it in a normal way, but you will see that the content is encrypted, it doesn't make any sense. But the key will eventually be stored somewhere, right? The, the keys are stored in hardware, so you don't have to worry about it. So which hardware stores the key then? Uh, we have this, uh, but uh, I didn't mention it in the first slide, but we call trusted execution environment. So this is the hardware enablers which we are using. Uh, like uh, for a not mobile world, for a PC world, there is a TPM. For mobile world, there is a different uh, technology. But you don't have to worry about it, so you don't have to worry about key management in this case at all. I was wondering like, how you protect the files from being tethered, or how you like, detect them from being storage. But, but if, if you have a signature, so usually how the signature works, so you, you, there is a hash computed and we verify the signature of the file. But you don't have to really kind of call the special IPS to verify the signature. You have only one IPS says, okay, check integrity. And this is, does all these cryptographic things are uh, in behind. The system itself, and it comes out of the key security. And if the key is like stored in hardware, then the hacker will probably have a hard drive to remove the key. Yeah, pretty much. So I think this is the last my slide, so let's go over, over it. So uh, 
Here's another situation. You have finite inter-process communication inside a device, and you may be afraid that while you're transferring something, for example, over DBus, it gets so somebody kind of read the data. So here I have two applications, which uh, application one would like to get some data, it would like to send it to application two, or this kind of cloud thing we call here potential untrusted zone, for example, it could be DBus or any other inter-process communication. And then our, what the application one can do, they provide also a library, which called MimoCrypt library, which uh, it can ask this uh, the corresponding IPI from the library, to, to sign this data in this case, and it will be, the data will be just returned together with the signature. And when the, the data, when the, the signature can be transferred over, for example, a DBus or anything else, and then an application too can use the same library to check uh, if this data really comes from application one. And again here, the good thing, you don't have to worry about any key management to establish your keys or to do. Everything is done again in hardware. All the key management is done. And uh, there is very convenient APIs to, to use to actually check these things. So the same could apply for encryption. So that uh, you can encrypt some data using MimoCrypt API. You can transfer the data over the, uh, again, example, DBus. And then another application could decrypt this data only if it's possessed some, uh, for example, resource token. The mechanism of resource token is used here as well. So you can say that you can encrypt the data and say everybody who has a user uh, data, access to user data, can decrypt this data. Or everybody who has uh, access to location data can decrypt this data because I know that inside there is location data. So it's very convenient and it's very flexible. This is how you can also, with, with the usage of another library, you can uh, secure your IPC communications. And uh, short conclusions, so our goal is to open source most of our security framework. It's not only up to us, it's we're coming from a company, but we'll try our best. And then uh, we actually already created a public project which calls MIMA 6 Platform Security, and you can find it in MIMAJutorials.org. So uh, we already have one repository under there which hosts libgrids library, so you can go check it out and start watching it. We really hope that we will add more uh, repositories very soon. And uh, I can, at the end of the presentation and later, I can answer uh, any questions you have. And the main thing while we're here, because we would really like to get a feedback from you and your opinions about our f a security framework, because it's the only way to get it better. So we won't get it better if we close and say that nobody knows about it, and we try to make it like very secure. So. We, we don't believe in it. We don't believe in security by obscurity. So we are here, we are talking about it, and we would like to get feedback for it. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> so if there are questions. Yes. Very basic thing. Affects me more as we have it mm -hmm. now. Okay. Uh, you know, what happened to the principle of least surprise? I get this device. I want to do, install something on it, so I type at get install SSH, and uh, no can do, I need SU for it. So how do, I, how do I set a password? I can find no information on that, and that, this is a principle of maximum surprise to a geek, that you can't set a, so you haven't got your own password. You mean the password for what? For? Well, so that I can run sudo. Out of the box, I, need, I just need to set a password. I don't know actually about well, current devices. I simply, sorry? I don't know about current, you, you mean that you, when you go to this device, you will not yeah. be able to, to uh, run it as a root or? Yes, I mean I have to install a package called extras and get a root shell on it, which, uh, which means I've got password as root and no security. No, but I, th I think we, they're going to work on it so that it will yeah. be protected. I mean, to a geek that says I've got no security on here and uh, you know, I don't know much about the previous devices. I don't really work even for these kind of devices. So for my, you, I guess you're speaking about MIMO 5 release. Yes. So I don't even, I can't even say anything about that one. I don't even work for that one. <laughs> Sorry. Any other questions? Uh, two questions. Um, you had the access control said this was based on the software source, on the repository. Is it also more fine-grained? I mean, if I have a repository with thousands of programs, I have a browser that I want to access the internet, I have another tool that I want to access my private data. It's kind of useless to only be able to send it globally for that one whole repository and not per program. Is there more fine 
but uh, access control is not per repository, so it's really per program on the device. Okay. So, so it's uh, so the repository uh, the mechanism is a way that uh, so the application on the device has its runtime credentials. So, that for example, access to the some private uh, access to user data, access to location. But uh, there is a control mechanism how it gets. So, for example, if it comes from very untrusted source, some source which there is no reputation whatsoever and don't trust this source, then it won't be able to get actually, uh, it can ask for many things in Sage's manifest file, but it won't be able to get them during runtime. Did, so, did, I, did I misunderstood that source is, means repository or does it mean something else? It, it can mean a repository in, in a classical way. It can mean also uh, what I said, we, we, we are going to support package signing. So it can also mean that it, it's really per pair, whenever who, sign, who has a key pair. So. No, we actually, so the application can, the package can provide a new resource. Yes. It will be, it can't provide some generic resource, so it can overwrite the current resource, but it can provide a known resource. It will be the kind of the uh, space name will be kind of local to a package, so but we don't, conf it doesn't conflict with memory resources, but it can provide any resource. There's no actually restrictions in that one. Yes. So this protected storage, which is going to be encrypted, varies. So it probably should not be used for the database cases because the database, so we, we are using hardware for their, like hardware accelerators to speed up the process. So it's, it's actually quite fast, but for database cases, when you need to access like very often the database, it's probably not the best solution. So we're actually working on one more solution to, we are working on better solutions, for especially for that cases. Yeah, I hope we can update on this one soon. Yes. When does, when does the user come into the picture? I mean, all, all you, what you said was repositories and blah. Is the user ever asked, do you really want to do that? <laughs> you, you, you're asking about user prompting. Yes. So I, I, I don't know, I can't really comment on this one in case we will have it or not yet. So we have to wait a bit. So it's really work in the progress uh, now and the, the current thing that I'm presenting is things that we, we already decided to do. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not a hardware person, so uh, I, I, I understand what you're talking about with side, side channel attacks, but I think we have hardware persons who, who knows about it. And I'm not talking even about offline attacks, where I get a device and I'm taking, trying to take the keys out of the TPM. I'm talking really about the two processes running on the same machine that can monitor each other. And, and by, just by that, they might be able to find this for themselves. I understand the only problem with I really I'm not a hardware person. I don't know, Jan, if you can comment that one. Mm, uh, no, no, question, but I cannot oh. say such an effects are generally ignored. There are no solutions to them or get them on. Generally, the process separation is costly. Okay, I have a question. Uh, what do you mean to, to install your own package or? Yes, uh, okay. It's, it's, we should be very careful about each and every privileges. There will be privileges which uh, you have to uh, actually, in order to uh, get it, 
you have to be very, very trusted. And I, I'm not the one, I'm just a technical person, so I don't know to whom these privileges will be given, like for example, DRAM privilege. So this is a very sensitive privilege we have to protect. But in any cases, for example, I have my Mod.org site, so my various repositories there, which are going to have quite high trust level probably. Again, I don't know. I'm not the one who's defining these policies. So I'm presenting the framework who actually can do many things, but I'm not the one who, who will decide. Like, but I, I think on my Mod.org you should be able to do this. Uh, yeah, I understand. So if you go to this, what, when I was presenting these two modes at the beginning, so if you go to this first mode, which, when you're allowed to do everything, you're allowed to modify the security policy, you're allowed to create your own, you're allowed to trust, I don't know, maybe your friend repository the most, and then you say that Nokia I don't trust, this, and something like this, but in that mode. Yes. <laughs> So if, if, you, if you go between the modes, so the encryption is our, so this is one thing we have to. So So if you had some data encrypted using this, for example, projected storage in this first mode, which is both like shipped with DRM things, when you move to open mode, this won't be able to decrypt the data because we don't have any control of the kernel and we can't actually preserve to guarantee anything, so this is just a, like the thing. But you can still, in that mode, use the encryption, and then it will be different encryption. The keys are available. Yes. Um, so if these keys are really valuable, how do I back them up? <laughs> <laughs> so this is no. Well, I mean, if you have a database and you have some keys, you have some keys, you have some keys, you have some you can't back, back them up because you can't actually transfer them between devices. There, there, will, there is, I know, that there, is a pro, uh, there is a project in MIMO which is called Backup Service, which will be able to back up your data and there is a like, complicated, complicated process how it will be done. So you will be able to back up your data, but not the keys. But then the data is not useful to me. I don't have the keys, right? No, but the keys, no, the keys are, no, the data would be probably, I don't know how it will work again, I'm not from there, but it probably will be decrypted and encrypted in some different keys and then pushed to backup, for example. But then so, no. Yeah. Yeah. But I have to give away my data. But, but it's your choice to use it or not to use it. You, you don't have to use it in this encryption service. I, yeah. I feel like I'm five years ago or so because this platform has been started and as I understand it, an SSH control is functionally pretty much equivalent to TPM in those aspects for which TPM has been dramatically criticized and rejected by it. So, my question is to turn this into some form of constructive question rather than a rant, which I'm uh, otherwise likely to do. Do you expect this to be compatible with version 3 of the DTL, which could contain clauses to prevent exactly this type of platform? And there's no concession to the, 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 any of the discussion that has happened in the community regarding this issue, so which are formulated in the DTL. So do you expect it to be compatible or do you ignore it? So my MIMO currently is GPL2, and uh, I don't have any, I, I'm not the one who is even deciding these things, but MIMO currently is GPL2. And that's why the kernel is GPL2, I will say that. Like, so I think that's a good answer, thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I don't know, for me, I'm, I, I'm not familiar with my mom, but for me, my mom is like a small kitty, and I will be quite upset if a thinkpad would check if the bootloader is from a thinkpad. And, uh, yes, we have this one. So, what are you concerned about? I would like to change the bootloader. For, and, and... Because maybe I have an OS operating system that this loader is not loading, I want to be boot, uh, not about the load, and the operating system so we'd like to put a different operating system on this no, device. But in this,
can have a load at the on that on side of three bits if you like. I can launch another loader, no? Yeah, in the stack. Yes, yeah. but I want to launch two loaders to load an OS. But there should be an enforcement point f for us. I mean, there should be a point where we will actually will make decisions here, and we have to keep at least something. Yeah, but why in all PCs, uh, the, the thing for the loader doesn't have a loader, but Nokia needs to import the loader. But if you can get still your own loader, like on top, why, why, why do you want to get rid of this loader? Why not? <laughs> That's probably not good reason enough yet. Yeah. Okay. I'm afraid I have to finish for now, but I will be available and together with my colleague, we will be available today the whole day for questions. But I think I have to finish now. Thank you.